I, I believe that I've gotten to meet everybody in the room. If I haven't, I'll definitely meet you afterwards. My name's Adam Moulton. Uh, I'm the new federal conservative candidate in Northumberland, Peterborough South. And uh, I appreciate everybody making the effort to come out here uh, and uh, meet the minister as well. And so uh, we, we appreciate uh, you making that effort. Uh, it's, it's great to see so many individuals as engaged and wanting to stay informed about uh, what's happening in our country at the national level. Um, and just a quick side note here, I'd also like to say thank you to some of the dignitaries that have joined us here today. Uh, we have our Member of Parliament from Northumberland, Quinny West, Rick Norlock. <laughs> We have the uh, conservative candidate uh, in the new riding Bay of Quinty, Jody Jenkins, here with us today. Uh, deputy Mayor uh, Roger is here. He's the deputy mayor of uh, Ashfordell Norwood as well. So thanks for coming out. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce a, a good friend of mine to you today, uh, Minister Jason Kenny. Uh, Minister Kenny has been serving the constituency of Calgary Southeast and Canadians since 1997. Uh, although an MP in Alberta, we, uh, we all should know that uh, Minister Kenny is a good uh, home, homegrown Ontario boy. So, uh, amongst the seemingly endless list of accolades, uh, Minister Kenny is known for his tireless work ethic and has been voted the best overall and hardest working MP by his colleagues in the Maclean's Magazine annual survey of parliamentarians. Uh, Mr. Kenny's work ethic, or Minister Kenny's work ethic and commitment to Canadians has helped him earn stewardship of some of our most significant portfolios in the government. From 2008 to 2013, he was the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. In 2013, he was asked by the Prime Minister to serve uh, as Minister of Employment and Social Development, where he was tasked with overhauling uh, the temporary foreign workers program. Uh, additionally, Minister Kenny has continued his role uh, as, the, uh, as the Minister of Multiculturalism. Uh, most recently, however, he was appointed as the Minister of National Defense, uh, where the breadth of his responsibilities start at home and extend far beyond our borders right here. Uh, we can all be thankful that we have uh, the leadership of such a hard-working, principled, and dedicated minister to oversee our many brave men and women in uniform who serve our country and protect our Canadian way of life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, to our new riding of Northumberland, Peterborough South, the Minister of National Defence, Jason Kenney. Thank you very much, Adam. Well, thank you very much, Adam, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's great uh, to be up here and uh, joined by my, my friend and colleague, uh, Rick Norlock. Uh, thank you, Rick, for your many years of service. We're going to miss you uh, in the House of Commons, and I'm going to mix, miss traveling to Mexico with you in the future. That's a that wasn't a that was actually a business trip. You were getting somebody out of jail down there. That was uh, that's that's a chat that's a <laughs> that's a chapter in my memoirs. That trip. Um, so I never thought I'd find myself in the women's prison in uh, in Guadalajara. I must say, especially with Rick. Um, <laughs> And it's, uh, it's great as well to see Jody Jenkins out here. Jody, uh, congratulations on your nomination. And uh, we're looking forward to you joining the Conservative team. And you'll be uh, privileged there to represent the men and women of Canadian Forces Base Trenton. And we wish you every, every success. Uh, as well, I think we have a couple of no ca candidates for nomination in, in the uh, Peterborough constituency. Thanks for coming out and for putting your names forward. But friends, I really wanted to come up here to um, thank all of you, to thank you uh, for nominating my friend Andrew Moulton for Adam Moulton for the candidacy in Quinty, what, what's the new riding called? Northumberland Peterborough South. Northumberland Peterborough South. Northumberland Peterborough South, uh, this new constituency. I, when I first uh, realized you have such a, can a young principal candidate stepping forward, it really gave me renewed hope for my own kind of political vocation. Uh, don't you feel that way, Rick? I mean, I'll tell you, Ottawa can be a trying place at times. Uh, and, and not just question period. It can be a, a place sometimes where uh, it's a real challenge. Uh, it's a real challenge to be a conservative. Uh, we have a lot of um, opposition, not just from the opposition parties, sometimes from the press gallery, uh, sometimes from the interest groups. And, uh, and sometimes that can become discouraging. But when you see uh, someone like Adam stepping forward with his enthusiasm, idealism, principles, energy, uh, and clarity of purpose. 
uh, it really renews one's sense of the of the uh, the calling of public service in elected office. Uh, and so I was so delighted to see that he won the nomination here. Uh, and I know he's working uh, flat out full time with an amazing energetic team, a lot of young volunteers, including some coming from all across Canada, to make sure that he gets elected. Uh, so I would I just wanted to say on behalf of Stephen Harper and our whole team in Ottawa. Uh, uh, thank you for nominating Adam, and thank you in advance for getting him elected as your next Member of Parliament. We don't want to be too presumptuous about that, but uh, when I came into the parking lot and I saw all the pickup trucks, I kind of felt like it was conservative country, i got to tell you. <laughs> felt like I was back home in Alberta. So it is great to be here. Uh, just to encourage you uh, in, the next, in the months ahead, uh, let me begin by putting aside one bit of speculation. The election will be, as per our legislation, on October the 19th. Um, we have brought in fixed date uh, fi uh, legislation for the election, um, which seemed like a good idea at the time. I mean, it takes away the government's advantage of, of choosing a date that, uh, to its, uh, that advantages itself. It levels the playing field. The downside is it means a very long election campaign because everyone knows when it's going to be. So effectively, when the House of Commons rises towards the end of this June, we're going to be into something like campaign season. Uh, like it or not, and uh, I'm glad that your team is already getting a head start on that. Um, but let me tell you, you're going to have a very good story to tell when you go to the small businesses and the farms and the homes of this constituency you'll have a great story to tell because uh, of the record of our government. Now, I'll, I'll say right off the top that we've not been perfect, we've made our mistakes. Any big organization does. Anyone running something as large as the Government of Canada inevitably is going to get a couple of things wrong. And having said that, I must tell you, when I travel around the world and talk to people uh, about Canada, about our government's leadership, they look at us, political and business leaders all around the world, look at Canada under Stephen Harper's leadership as a model, a model of growth and stability, of prosperity and security. And they say to me, how did you do it? How did you guys be the last major developed country to enter the global recession of 2008? How were you the first major developed country to pull out of it? How is it that you've had one of the best job creation records since the global downturn? And how is, it, how is it that you've done so with fiscal responsibility? And that's true, we went into a deficit when inevitably we had the worst economic crisis in the world since the Great Depression. Revenues went down and expenditures went up. Expenditures to help out folks who were looking for work and expenditures for critical infrastructure to help put people back to work. But fundamentally, we made the right choices. We looked ahead. We exercised what real leadership is. We did that when we first came to office by, uh, as we say out west, we started uh, making hay while the sun was shining by paying down the debt. We paid down about $40 billion off the federal debt. But we also started by keeping our commitment to reduce the tax burden on Canadian businesses and families. Uh, we cut the GST early on from 7 to 6 to 5 percent. Kept our word. I think people were surprised a government would do that. Uh, people have become cynical about governments that promised to reduce taxes and instead raise them. We did the opposite. We, we kept our word and we reduced the GST. We reduced income taxes on families. We brought in income splitting for seniors. We reduced taxes for small businesses and all the employers. We brought in things like the um, child uh, uh, fitness credit early in, in, our, in our tenure and so many other, in fact, over 130 separate tax cuts, which all together add up to about 130, uh, well, excuse me, about $30 billion in annual tax relief every single year, or to express it for each family, about $3,400 in tax relief for an average family, year after year after year, and that was before this year's family tax cut. Now, I don't know if any of you watched the, I, was, I, I had my, uh, a, a television on in my hotel last night and I saw an ad from two accounting firms, H&R Block and another one, uh, advertising the $2,000 family tax cut. The family tax cut that the Prime Minister announced uh, late in 2014 
that for me is so important. It's something I have worked for my entire political life. In fact, before I got elected, back when I was president of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation in the, in the early and mid 1990s, I was fighting for fairness, tax fairness for families. I was fighting to eliminate the discrimination against uh, two parent families with a single income. And that wasn't politically correct. In fact, I remember when I was the finance critic in the opposition in, in Ottawa, uh, I once asked my, uh, the, uh, the Liberal uh, Junior Finance Minister, good fellow Jim Peterson, I asked him, why is it that the tax code would discriminate against single income families? Why is it that the tax system would ch charge as much as $4,000 more for a family with one income earner as a, as a family with an equal income but two income earners. And, and I said, what, what does that say about the dad or mom who works at home with young kids or perhaps elderly relatives in need of care? And he said that stay-at-home parents, the reason why the tax code did this is that stay-at-home parents don't really work. That was the ideology. That was the reason behind the discrimination in the tax code. I said, excuse me, dads and moms who work with young kids, who work at home, do the most important work in the world and they deserve our respect and our support and now with the family tax cut, they're gonna get that support and that respect. So, all together, so that's, that's another two, up to $2,000 in further tax relief for, uh, for families and uh, bundled together with that the universal child care benefit which is a huge support it means that a that a, a fa for every child under the age of, of of six now each one of the, the parents of those children will um, receive what is it now nineteen hundred dollars uh nineteen hundred and twenty one thousand nine hundred and twenty dollars a year um which is very so imagine a family with two kids under six are going to be receiving um, upwards of $3,800 $3, a year in support from the Government of Canada uh, and in addition to the family tax cut. So you bundle all these things together and what you have is a government, a government with a degree of humility. Now our friends in the Liberal and New Democratic parties, they believe, see, and, and this is an honest conviction they come by, they believe that politicians and bureaucrats in Ottawa know better how to spend an extra dollar than families and homemakers and small business people in Eastern Ontario. They believe that more good can be done by taxing that money away from people, running it through an expensive Ottawa bureaucracy, sending it out to the provinces and running it through their expensive bureaucracy, and then sending the money out to government-run, institutional, union-operated daycare centers that can only be used by parents that are working nine to five in cities. I'll tell you, they're not planning on building government subsidized daycare centers in the country for farm families or rural families. They're not planning on operating those for the shift work families where people are working overnight shifts or whose schedules don't mesh with those of the government daycare centers. So what that is, it's a, the whole concept, it's a huge transfer of wealth from some families to other families. From, and it tilts the balance. It says, we don't want to respect the choices that parents make. We want to make those choices for them. The conservative approach is totally different. We approach this with humility. We say that the best experts on childcare aren't uh, bureaucrats, and Lord knows they're not politicians. The, the experts on childcare are called mom and dad, and we should support the decisions that they make. And if, if there are families who choose to make a sacrifice by giving up a full-time second income in order to spend more time with young children at home, for example, we believe that choice should be respected and they shouldn't be penalized for making it. That's what the family tax cut is about. So this is a, 
huge issue that you're going to have in the next election, uh, Adam, to take to the doors and ask people, do they want J Justin Trudeau and Thomas Mulcair to take those benefits away from them? If they've got two kids under the age of six, do they want Justin Trudeau and Tom Mulcair taking away the $3,800 a year universal child care benefit? Do they want them taking away the $2,000 in the f family tax cut? Do they want Liberals or NDP raising the GST back up because you know they will. It doesn't matter what they say in the election. They've got to pay for their tens of billions of dollars of uncosted, uh, irresponsible promises somehow. So the next election will be about those choices. And, and by the way, not only do, do, do our tax cuts indicate a kind of humility on the part of the government and a, and a confidence in the decisions of families, but it also expresses our fundamental belief, our Canadian belief, in the creative power of human freedom. We believe as conservatives, we believe as Canadians, that what generates wealth and opportunity and prosperity in a society isn't central planning by governments and bureaucrats, it is the risk-taking entrepreneurship and the hard work of ordinary people running businesses, running farms, uh, working hard to get ahead, and they want to be rewarded and not punished for their hard work. And that's really what the, our accomplishment of lower taxes achieves. So expanded human freedom, respect for the choices of families, and all of that has, is but one of the reasons why we've seen uh, one of the best economic records uh, in uh, the developed world since the global downturn. Now, here's the remarkable thing. We've managed to achieve that. Oh, by the way, altogether, all of our tax cuts have brought the federal tax burden down to its lowest level as a share of the Canadian economy since the 1950s. The lowest federal tax burden in seven decades. As far as I'm concerned, that one fact alone has been wor with, worth the price of admission for the Harper government. And not only have we achieved that, we have achieved that with fiscal responsibility. Because I can tell you that when our colleague Joe Oliver, the finance minister, stands up in the House of Commons this uh, next month to present his budget, it will be a balanced budget. We will be back in the black. We will be one of the first major developed economies in the world to come back to a balanced budget since the global downturn. Imagine we've done that while reducing taxes to, to their lowest levels at the, for, for the federal government in seven decades. That's something to write home about. And, and it didn't happen by accident. It took tough choices. It took leadership. Now, people might contest or quibble over any one of those choices. But I'll tell you this. Unlike Justin Trudeau, we do not believe that, quotes, the budget will balance itself. <laughs> Now, I don't know, everyone here has to run a budget. Their personal budget, their household budget, their business budget. And everyone knows that in running a budget, you have to make choices. The budget, your budget doesn't balance itself. Ottawa's won't balance itself. And any prime minister who thinks it will is going to run this country into fiscal ruin. And that means more borrowing through to fund reckless spending and ultimately higher taxes, higher taxes that will kill growth and jobs today and that will, that will also re reduce opportunities for our youth in the future. That's the wrong direction and that will be a choice in the next election. So we've achieved um, one of the strongest economic records in the developed world, one of the best job creation records, um, the lowest federal taxes in seven decades, restored balance and fairness for families respecting their choices, expanded freedom, and, oh yes, we've also balanced the budget and restored fiscal responsibility. Now, that's a pretty good record, but that's not the end of the story. Because look, think of the, uh, the achievements of this government in so many er other areas. Think of what we've done to restore balance to the criminal justice system. Now, we get a lot of criticism from the CBC and the Toronto Star and the opposition parties for doing this. Um, they say, well, why did you need to make all of these changes? Why are you so tough on crime that they call it, quotes, an ideological obsession? You know, I don't think 
justice is a ideological obsession. I think it is a natural inclination that people want a justice system where there are serious consequences for serious crime. Rick served, as you know, as an Ontario Provincial Police Officer for many years. And he, and you know, I think we have eight or nine members of our caucus. Including the Senate, about a dozen. A dozen Conservative parliamentarians who have worn, have put their lives on the line to maintain the, uh, the rule of law and uh, defend Canadians as police officers. And there's a reason why they're all in the Conservative caucus. People like Rick, if I, I think I can put words in your mouth, who were so tired of locking up bad guys only to see them walk the streets after little or no time serving custodial sentences so often to just create new victims uh, and, and new crimes. And we said, no, no, there, you know, we, yes, we believe, hopefully, in the rehabilitation of criminals. We want to give first-time offenders and nonviolent offenders a, a chance to get on the right path. But for those serious, violent, repeat offenders, who again and again have, through their violence, created victims in our society, we believe that they should do real time behind bars. And that's exactly what our justice reforms have been about. Let me give you just one example. If you're going to the doors or talking to a neighbor about this in the next few months, and they say, well, hasn't the, haven't the Harper crew gone too far on all this justice stuff? Look, last summer, um, down in New Brunswick, uh, a young man uh, shot and killed per deliberately three uh, RCMP officers. Uh, there are very few crimes more heinous than purposefully killing our police officers because that's actually targeting the rule of law. That's direct attack on the very basis of our society. Three RCMP officers, he's, he was convicted um, and under the old liberal justice system, this uh, triple murderer of police officers would have been sentenced to one concurrent, quotes, life sentence of 25 years um, and would have been able to apply for parole after just 15 years through the faint hope clause. But people say, well, he never would have gotten parole. Actually, we've had first degree murders who have been released on the, on the faint hope clause. And what about the victims? What about the victims' family, uh, Clifford Olson's victims' families? He, 15 years after he was sentenced, he began applying annually for parole under the Faint Hope Clause, which meant that every year the parents of the children that he murdered had to come to a parole hearing and plead against his early release and relive the, the, the terrible crime. That's what would have happened under the old system to the families of these three RCMP officers. One 25-year sentence, 15-year eligibility, eligibility to apply for, for release. But thanks to our conservative government's criminal justice reforms, we moved from concur concurrent sentences for offenses like first-degree murder to consecutive sentences, and so this murderer was sentenced to 75 years in jail with no right to apply for parole. He will never see the light of day, and that's how it should be. That's how it should be. Now, I suspect close to 100% of your constituents here, Adam, agree with that principle. And I think you're going to have to call out your New Democratic and Liberal opponents to explain why they want to go back to the broken system of the past. So we've done so much, to, and we have more work to do in that regard. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge the, the uh, excellent work that Rick has done in Parliament, including on the Public Safety Committee, to move these issues forward. We've done so much on to bring justice back to the justice system, and, it's, and, and, and to do so many other things. You know, I was Minister of Immigration for five years. When we came to office, we inherited what was in many ways a broken and dysfunctional immigration system people waiting for up to a decade for a decision on their applications in a queue of a million people, and a lot of abuse of Canada's generosity, huge numbers of fake, unfounded uh, uh, refugee claims, of, of, of 
uh, fake immigration marriages, crooked immigration consultants preying on the vulnerable, human trafficking, human smuggling, and so many other problems. And we systematically went through the entire immigration system and cleaned up the, that, the liberal mess. This was politically risky. We were taking a risk by doing it. People were going to call us names. But you know what? We found out that the vast majority of new Canadians supported those immigration reforms. They want to make sure that, yes, this is an open country of opportunity and hospitality, but that, we, that this is a country that is open and hospitable to those who want to come and integrate, to those who want to come and respect our laws, who want to become Canadian, who want to work hard and succeed. This is not, there is no open door to this country anymore, at least, for those who would seek to come and abuse our generosity or who refuse uh, to respect our laws. And uh, so that was a hugely important area of reform. We've also, we've also, I think, as a government, been so effective at restoring Canada's principled voice uh, as a democracy on the world stage. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's just a couple of examples. Boy, and, and a lot of the critics in Ottawa don't like this. but. Canada used to follow a foreign policy of always trying to find the middle ground, the so-called position of moral neutrality between any two sides in the world. So back 15 years ago, when bombs were going off in Israel, when terrorist, anti-Semitic terrorist organizations like Hezbollah or Hamas were blowing up school buses and pizzerias and discotheques and wedding receptions in Israel, killing dozens of people every month. The Liberal government, whenever that happened, would issue a statement saying, we condemn this violence, but we call on all sides to exercise restraint and to stop the cycle of violence. Calling on all sides to exercise restraint? Exercise, telling the Israelis to be restrained and to stop the cycle, like they're somehow responsible for the murder of their civilians by terrorist organizations? Frankly, that's not neutrality. That's just distorted thinking. No, we, we as a government have said that, that's not our view. There is no neutrality between terrorism and anti-terrorism, between deliberately targeting civilians and then responding to terrorist criminals. And we have stood up for the right of Israel to be a secure homeland and refuge for the Jewish people. And we are proud of that. We are proud of that. Just as we have stood up to Vladimir Putin's aggression in Ukraine and elsewhere uh, in Eastern Europe, you know that, recall that Prime Minister Harper was at the G20 summit in Melbourne, Australia last year, and Vladimir Putin. Uh, put out his hand, approached our Prime Minister, put out his hand, and Stephen Harper said, Mr. Putin, I guess I'll shake your hand, just so I can tell you that you need to get out of Ukraine right now. This is a Prime Minister who has been leading the world in sanctions on Vladimir Putin's government because of his aggression, his de facto invasion of Ukraine, that we, we, we've been providing military support through non-lethal equipment and, and other key support to the Ukrainians. This is Canada on the world stage today. Tomorrow uh, morning, I will be at CFB Trenton, um, Jody, to receive our fifth C-17 Globemaster strategic airlift aircraft. This is reflective of Canada under Stephen Harper's leadership. This equipment gives us the ability to project Canada's presence defend our interests, and advance our values all around the globe. When we came to office, we had to beg, borrow, and plead in order to hitch a ride to take our troops or our humanitarian equipment to any corner of the world. Now, we just stage it right out of uh, uh, Trenton. We're able to get our DART team and our humanitarian re relief to the people, the victims of the Haitian earthquake within 36 hours. We're able to get over to the, the Philippines to help the victims of the typhoon within a couple of days. And yes, we're able to deliver armaments to the 
brave Kurdish Peshmerga rebels fighting these genocidal maniacs and the so-called Islamic State and we're able to carry equipment to our friends in Ukraine so that they can body armor, night vision goggles, protect themselves from Russian, uh, in the Russian invasion. That's the Canada of today where we don't just talk a good talk, we actually walk that talk. I just had the General Secretary of NATO in, my, uh, in, in Ottawa in my office last Monday and he was profoundly impressed by how Canada punches above its weight all around the world in defending our values uh, and our interests, just as our men and women are doing in Iraq today. I was in Trenton a little while ago uh, for a ramp ceremony for Sergeant Andrew Dwyron from New Brunswick, who tragically uh, died in a, in a friendly fire incident in northern Iraq recently. And I was reminded of the that every single day our men and women put their lives on the line by serving us in our uniform. And when I was at that ceremony, all of his friends and comrades and family said to me, please carry on with this mission. We don't want what happened to Andrew to deter Canada from doing what good it is in Iraq today. We have this genocidal terrorist organization that is seeking to slaughter the Christians and other religious and ethnic minorities of the Middle East, that beheads children, that beheads elderly Christians in their hospital beds if they refuse to convert, that has taken thousands of young sexual slaves from minority communities like the Yazidis, and if left unchecked, would metastasize like a cancer, like a, the death cult that it is to occupy enormous swaths of the Middle East with access to resources and military equipment, and it would represent, if left unchallenged, a seductive message to young people susceptible to radicalization in Canada and all around the world that, the, that there is this vision of a, of a so-called caliphate, this bizarre notion of an Islamic kingdom founded on, on a violent application of 7th century Sharia law. We cannot allow that to happen. As it is, over 130 young Canadians have left Canada to go and join this organization in Iraq, an organization that has repeatedly expressed its hostility to Canada, calling on its supporters to kill Canadians wherever we are, and which we believe inspired the two terror attacks here last October. And so just as Canada landed on Juneau Beach uh, 71 years ago, just as we defended the people of South Korea from communist tyranny, just as we stood up against the reach of global, the global jihadi terrorist menace in Afghanistan, we have a responsibility with dozens of other allies to protect international security and our security uh, in, in Iraq today. Of course, ultimately, it's the responsibility of the local countries and populations, but we will be there to support them because we, run, we understand that it's better to defeat and degrade that threat there than to have it grow and expand and ultimately pose a very real risk to us here at home and around the world. So that's a government that's responsible about Canada's place in the world. And, co and compare that to Mr. Trudeau's position, who when asked last fall about the use of the Canadian military to challenge the ISIL terrorist organization, made a juvenile, um, off-color joke about our Air Force and about the Prime Minister. Justin Trudeau, who when innocent Ukrainians were being gunned down in the streets of Kiev, a year ago, made light of the fact and said that maybe the Russians were just upset because they lost to Canada in hockey. Justin Trudeau, who when asked what country he most admires in the world, said, quotes, the basic dictatorship of China. This is a man who does not have the judgment, or I would submit the ability, to be the leader of this great country, this G7 democracy. And Adam, that's a message you're going to have to take as well uh, to the doors. Uh, finally, friends, I, I'll, I know I've spoken long enough already, but I, I wanted to wrap up by saying that one of the there's so many things that I think we've achieved that are not well recognized, and one of them 
is I believe that our government has quietly, gradually renewed a, a sense of Canadian pride rooted in our history. What do I mean by that? Well, when we came to office, when I became immigration and citizenship minister, I discovered that, the, the, that there was a guide that aspiring citizens had to read in order to be tested on their knowledge of Canada. And this guide was a kind of parody of a politically correct liberal version of Canadian identity. It's as though our history started in 1967 or something. It's as though our constitution started in 1982, instead of 1867, or heaven forbid, it, with the Magna Carta in 1215. There wasn't a single word in this liberal conception of Canada about our military history. Let me repeat that. We have 120,000 Canadians buried abroad who defended us, made the ultimate sacrifice for, for Canada. The most important Canadians in our history. And they couldn't find one sentence in the book about Canada for new Canadians about our military history, about our 120,000 war dead, about Juneau Beach, about Vimy Ridge, uh, about our sacrifices. There was one throwaway line about peacekeeping. They just whitewashed our entire military history out of our past. You know, there were a lot of liberal scandals, a lot of misspending, a lot of, a, a, a lot of uh, corruption like ad scam. But that for me was the biggest scandal. It's whitewashing our military history out of our past. But they, had, uh, they found space for a full page on recycling in the same book. <laughs> So I rewrote the book, and I said that I thought it was more important for new Canadians to understand the meaning of the red poppy than the blue box. More important to understand the meaning of sacrifice and patriotism than recycling. Nothing, I have nothing against recycling, just for the record. Um, and we also said in that book that Canada's tolerance and diversity that Canada is a tolerant and diverse country, but that our tolerance and diversity do not extend to certain so-called barbaric cultural, cultural practices, including so-called honor crimes, um, or female genital mutilation, or forced marriages, or spousal abuse, that such crimes are severely, are, are condemned in Canada and severely punished under our law. Because I thought it was important for us to move beyond political correctness and move on beyond this distorted idea that multiculturalism equals cultural relativism. I thought it was important to say no, that Canada actually has certain normative values that are rooted in our history. I thought it was important that we say we must find unity in our diversity based on values that are rooted in our history, about the rule of law, the equality of men and women, religious freedom, parliamentary governance. And we did that. And you know, it was new Canadians who are eager to integrate, who embrace that the most. But Justin Trudeau objected. He said he thought it was insensitive of me to condemn honor co crimes. That means like what happened in Kingston, you recall? Guy who drove the car and killed uh, 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 two, uh, two girls in his family. In, in, we believe, I said, that, that, that these crimes are barbaric. And Justin Trudeau said he thought it was insensitive to refer to honor crimes as being barbaric. You know, this is a, th 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 again, I think that as a government, while we've made some mistakes, we have delivered on our promises, we've kept our word, we've been one of the most effective governments in the world in terms of economic management and fiscal responsibility. We've restored principle to our foreign policy and the ability to project our influence around the world. We've restored justice to the justice system. And we have uh, also, I think, restored a historically grounded sense of our Cana shared Canadian identity. For those and so many other reasons, I think it is important that we work doubly hard in the next six months to get Adam elected, to, uh, to get Jody elected, to get uh, whoever the candidate is in the next in the other Peterborough constituency elected to get a strong stable national conservative majority government elected so that we can carry on the strong leadership for the future thank you very much god bless you all
Uh, awesome. Thank Jason, thank you. Minister Kenny, thank you very much again for, uh, for coming by here and uh, speaking with us. And uh, we, we do have a lot of work left to do in the upcoming months. And I know that I have significant shoes to fill out of our, uh, out of our last MP, Rick Norlock. And I'm looking forward to getting to know each and every one of you a little bit better as we go on down this trail. And uh, But um, what, one thing that I can say about campaigns is they take many, many hands. Whether you are in Northumberland, Peterborough South, whether you are in Peterborough, whether you are in the Bay of Quinty, it takes many, many hands to be able to get this job done. Uh, and so it takes... Uh, it, it takes people like you that are that are that are dedicated to uh, conservative values that are going to get Stephen Harper uh, reelected, uh, and we need your help to be able to do that. So, uh, on your way out the door, if that is something that does interest you, make sure you let us know because we want to be able to get you tied in. We want to be able to keep you engaged and informed in that process. So, thank you all very much again for coming, and I look forward to seeing you soon.